Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I've had a lot of people ask for my thoughts on Apple Silicon and the new M1 based Macs, but instead of throwing a bunch of benchmarks and technical details at you, I'd rather share my experiences so far with real world usage. I bought a 13 inch MacBook Pro as soon as the M1 models were announced. So as of when I filmed this, I've had it for a few weeks now. There's been a ton of hype for these machines, and a lot of people's imaginations ran wild about how capable they'd end up being. Apple's ARM-based chips in the iPhone and iPad have certainly been very impressive, so it's reasonable to think that a chip for the Mac would be even more powerful. And I'll admit that I got caught up in some of that myself, really anticipating this new era in the Mac platform and what it'll mean to the rest of the computer industry. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. So when I got this laptop and started using it, I was a little let down. It was no fault of this machine, but rather my own expectations. Ultimately, it's just another Mac. The user experience really isn't any different. I mean, it launches apps quickly and it wakes from sleep a bit faster, which is nice. But if you're thinking that buying one of these would be this, I don't know, amazing experience that makes you really feel like it's a computer from the future, well, the differences are a bit more subtle. That said, those subtleties are actually really profound. The first one I noticed was battery life. I'd been using this MacBook for about a week off and on for basic tasks, surfing the web, watching videos, and that sort of stuff. And I realized at one point that the battery was still half charged and I hadn't plugged it in. Well, since I took it out of the box. Apple says this new MacBook Pro can get 20 hours of battery life with light tasks like this. Now, those of us into technology know that the numbers manufacturers tend to publish are a bit optimistic at best, but this is an occasion where I actually kind of believe it. No, not everyone will get 20 hours of use with their particular workflow, but I think for most people, both the MacBook Air and Pro will make it through the day on one charge with plenty of time to spare. I specifically bought the Pro because it offers active cooling. There's a fan in it, while the Air is passively cooled. And that's because I really, really wanted to see what M1 could do when editing video. I actually put together most of last week's episode on this machine, and it was halfway in that it dawned on me that the fan hadn't really spun up, and the case of the machine was barely warm. By comparison, my 2017 iMac routinely needs to ramp up the cooling while I'm editing. And it's a decently powerful machine with an i7 7700K and Radeon Pro 580 graphics. M1 just doesn't break a sweat. And that also led to an interesting thought. There's been lots of criticism over the years about how Apple's computer designs have impacted their performance. The pursuit of thinness and quiet operation has meant inadequate cooling and thus thermal throttling. In a way, M1 kind of vindicates Apple in this regard. Since its performance is so high, but its thermal requirements are so much lower than Intel chips, everyone wins now. And as for performance, yes, it's as good as you've probably heard. For comparison, I rendered out my IKEA Frequence teardown video from a while back on both machines. The project is in a 4K 10-bit timeline and about 17 minutes long. I turned off background rendering in Final Cut and deleted any render or cache files. This meant that when I went to export the project to a ProRes 422 file, everything would need to get done on the fly. Color grading, transitions, audio, effects, so on. The iMac did it in just over 24 minutes, which really is pretty decent. I've generally been happy with its performance, but the M1 MacBook Pro did it in half the time. And that's really impressive, especially considering it has integrated graphics. Admittedly, this is a best case scenario test. It's an Apple application optimized to run on Apple hardware, and no doubt M1 was designed with hardware acceleration specifically meant to make tools like Final Cut Pro work better. 
My iMac has hardware accelerated video encoding too, but Apple has to use what Intel and AMD provide and can't customize it like they can their own silicon. After rendering out a project to ProRes, the next step I usually take is to convert the file to H.264 to make it faster to upload to YouTube. On my iMac, Handbrake did this in a little less than 36 minutes at 14 frames per second using the X.264 software encoder. No hardware acceleration involved. The MacBook took a little over 31 minutes at 17 frames a second. Yeah, that's only a 20% increase in speed, but it was also using the first handbrake beta that's Apple Silicon native. I have no doubt that subsequent versions will improve performance even further. If you have non-native Mac apps, chances are they'll work seamlessly. The Rosetta 2 emulation is totally transparent, except for the very first time you try to use it when it prompts you to install it. Emulation performance is gonna vary a lot depending on the app. Some have been seen to run even faster through Rosetta 2 than they do on an Intel Mac, while others may not be as quick. A worst case scenario is actually Handbrake again. When I ran the same encoding test using the Intel build through Rosetta, it performed worse than the iMac. Not by a ton, but compared to the native results, it goes to show how important it'll be for apps to get updated for the new architecture to really take the most advantage of it. One thing that's a casualty of the change to that new architecture is virtualization and bootcamp, especially of Windows. x86 versions of Windows just won't work. Rosetta doesn't support virtualization programs like Parallels or VMware Fusion, and Apple doesn't even offer Bootcamp on M1 Macs yet. If there are Windows apps you rely on, you might be able to come up with an esoteric workaround using tools like Wine, but otherwise you're out of luck. Apple has said that the door is open for Windows on these new Macs, but the ball is in Microsoft's court as to whether they'll sell copies of Windows for ARM processors. The last thing I want to talk about is how Apple Silicon relates to the rest of the computer industry. While there's been a lot of excitement for it, I've also seen other reactions from PC enthusiasts. Some have been staunch Apple haters who would never say a good thing about one of their products, but after seeing the performance figures are now admitting that these M1 Macs are compelling. Others, though, are still dismissing it as being just an Apple thing and sticking to their opinions that AMD or Intel are better. Yes, there are chips from both companies that are faster than M1, but they draw more power, generate more heat, and need more CPU cores to beat M1's benchmarks. And M1 is just the first chip of many. It was designed to work in low power devices like laptops, so subsequent chips designed for devices like the iMac are gonna have fewer limitations and thus even better performance. ARM is simply a much more efficient architecture and it's hard to see a future where it doesn't eclipse x86. I think that's something to look forward to because it'll not only yield better performance, but also more choices. ARM doesn't really sell chips themselves. Instead, they license out the designs for others to tweak and manufacture, like Apple, Samsung, and Qualcomm. Other companies could start making ARM-derived CPUs too and offer real competition. We could finally break away from the AMD and Intel duopoly, and that's hard not to get excited about. Competition is better for everyone. Even Microsoft is getting serious about ARM. Yeah, the Surface RT was a disaster, but that was due to a boneheaded design decision and not a limitation of the technology. Since then, they've moved on to the Surface Pro X and in October 2020, even launched the second generation of that hardware. And perhaps most importantly, Windows for ARM now has emulation capability for x86 apps. Microsoft wouldn't have gone to the trouble if they didn't think it was worth it long term. It's clear Apple's role here is that of a trendsetter. They've done it many times before, sometimes good, like with the original iMac helping push the industry to take USB seriously, and sometimes bad, like taking away the headphone jack. 
I think the computer industry as a whole needed something to shake it up, and Apple Silicon is exactly that. No one knows quite what the future of computing will look like, but I'm liking what I see so far. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.